Hi, my name is Meredith Cowden, and I am from Cleveland, Ohio. I was diagnosed with acute myeloid leukemia in 2001, and so I've, uh, I've been around for a while, we'll say. So the way that I uh, was diagnosed with AML was one of the more distressful experiences, actually. Um, for me, it wasn't like a real cut and dry kind of thing. Um, so I was 19. I was at art school. And so I was loving life. I was dating a guy that I was like super into. And, and so this, and I had started, it was around like, actually around uh, spring semester. So it was, you know, probably around April, May. And I started to feel kind of like fluish. I didn't feel great. I got real tired and, you know, like, and so I, you know, dealt with it for a minute and then I went, it just wouldn't go away. And so then I went to the, um, the university clinic and, you know, they were like, oh, we think you probably just have mono. So, you know, here's the Z pack or whatever, take this, you'll be fine. I was like, oh, okay, cool. So, and so I took the Z pack and then it, it was better for a little bit. And then it, um, got worse again and it got it got progressively much much worse and so um it it reached a point where I was in the clinic pretty much close to every day if not every other day and I like I was like I I was exhausted I was just like I'm this might be graphic I'm sorry but just like randomly throwing up and like it was just really I was really 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 sick and I couldn't hold food down. I couldn't eat. I had trouble sleeping. It was just a mess. And and they kept coming back and saying, yeah, I mean, it, I just, I, I think it's just a really bad case of mono. I was like, okay. And, and so then I did a thing that I normally do where I just like, I get frustrated and then I'm like, screw this. I'm not going to deal with this, whatever. So the guy I was dating was like, hey, you want to go see the show? And I was like, yeah, let's go out. Even though I felt terrible. And, and so like, this is one of the most memorable parts of this whole experience to me. And so I think this is why I tell it, but, um, so I had gone to class and like got back to my dorm and I had 17 messages on my, we had landlines right in the college. And so like on my landline, there were 17 messages from the doctor at the clinic saying, you have to go to the emergency room. I have a bed waiting for you there. This seems so much more serious. I, I ran some tests and I think you have to go. And in my 19 year old brain, I was like, mm, uh, uh, I don't know. I really want to go see this show. I haven't like gotten to hang out with this guy in like a, a minute. Uh, and like, I was literally on my way out the door to go to this show and the phone rang again and it was late. And so I was like, in my mind, I was like, I know if I answer the phone, I'm going to have to go to the emergency room. And so like, I had this weird, like slow time kind of like moment where I was just like, do I answer it? Do I not? What do I do? And I'm so glad that I answered the phone and actually came to my senses and talked to the doctor and he was like, I think that you may have, um, he's like, I don't mean to alarm you, but I think you may have cancer. And so I was like, oh, well, oh, okay. So I, I went to the emergency room. I called the guy and I was like, um, I have to go to the ER. Sorry. Can we go out another time? And, and he, he was so sweet about it. But so I went to the emergency room and, um, I remember, that uh, there was the ER doctor and he, I was in a little like curtained off area. He handed me a Dixie cup of water and said, you have leukemia. We need to call your parents. And I was just like, and the only things that, that I knew about leukemia at the time were bald kids and people die. And so I was just like, what? And, and then we called my parents and had to tell my, and this was at like two in the morning. And so woke them up, had to tell them, you know, that this was going on. And so they, and so I was at the University of Cincinnati in Ohio, and I grew up in um, like around the Cleveland area in Akron, Ohio. And so my parents drove 
like they just got in the car and they drove down, which I'm, I'm so grateful for. And, um, and so they put me in this, they put me, they took me to a room. And the other thing that happened with this was that there, and I, I don't quite understand why this happened, but, um, there were a group of doctors and they had different opinions. There were some that said that they, you know, they said I had acute leukemia. And then there were other ones who were like, no, this is just really, really bad mono. And, and so, but I remember they were standing outside of my, my room arguing about it. And they like the one, the ones with like who were, you know, she has leukemia, were like, she's going to die. We need to start treatment. And I, I could overhear all of this. And, and I was alone. I was 19. I was terrified. My parents hadn't gotten there yet. And so like it was, so it was a really, really horrible experience being diagnosed. And then finally, my parents got me out of the hospital, took me back home, and I, um, I uh, met with my primary care doctor who had received all of the, the testing and the information from the doctors. And she sat down with me and then she explained that I had leukemia and, you know, got me hooked up with the care that I needed for, for chemotherapy and everything. But that whole experience was, I mean, I, I, I remember it so vividly because it was so intense. And um, so my primary care doctor um, you know, said I, I, the next day I had, I had to start chemotherapy right away. And so the next day I was, I went to, um, Akron General Hospital on their, um, cancer floor. And, uh, I started a high dose of, of, uh, pretty intense chemotherapy. And, um, I, so there are, there are things that I remember one way and other people, tell me it was a different way. And I believe them because I think, you know, probably my brain was like, I don't even know how to work right now. And so um, I didn't, I didn't know. I thought that the chemotherapy that I got then just didn't work, that um, it was ineffective. Apparently it, it was because the kind of chemotherapy, the kind of cancer that I had um, would not be, be, uh, it wouldn't last in remission very long with just chemotherapy. And so it was determined that I needed to have a bone marrow transplant. And so then, and they didn't do that at, at the hospital that I was at. And so then they transferred me to the Cleveland Clinic um, where I had my bone marrow transplant, which was a, another sort of relatively intense experience um, because my, so so I had the, um, I had the chemo, um, I think in May, and then I had, I think another dose in July. See, I don't remember, but then I went to, um, the Cleveland clinic to have the bone marrow transplant, uh, at the end, end of early, early September. And, uh, and this is, I think it's important to keep in mind, this is in 2001. So, um, so I, so you have like induct, like the first, they basically wipe out your immune system. And so you're in this very like enclosed space. It's very protected. You're in kind of like a glass box. Um, and so that was kind of its own weird thing. But then, so I got the, um, the chemotherapy to kill out my immune system and my transplant was scheduled for September 12th of 2001. And that is the day after 9-11. And so then um, on the day before my transplant, one of the nurses who I absolutely adored, but one of the nurses like in the morning came into my room, was like, turn on your TV, turn on your TV. And in my room, we watched um, the plane fly into the second tower and then it was just sort of like, in my mind, I was like, oh, my God, everything is falling apart. Like, the world is just, what is going on? And, and you know, and there were um, questions about whether or not, my, my mom was particularly concerned about if 
the, you know, my sister had been my bone marrow donor and that if her bone marrow and everything had to go to New York to help those people rather than for me. And um, I guess one of the doctors in, said, no, I mean, Meredith will die without this. And so we have, it's, she's, this is a special situation. She, she, this is saved for her. Um, and so like, it was just a really weird, weird experience and strange time. And it just, it felt just like so overwhelming and, and just very surreal for me. It created a, a really specific um, way of thinking for me that kind of translated into why am I worth living and they weren't, you know? And so I had a lot of survivor's guilt. I had a lot of like, I have to make my life worthwhile because all of these people died. And, you know, we're, you know, there's nothing that separates us. And, and so I felt, I was, I struggled a lot with that for, for a, a decent amount of time, um, following my transplant. Mm -hmm. So after the transplant, um, the, I stayed in the hospital for, um, a, almost a month and my goal was to get home for my birthday, which is October 3rd. And, and I did it. And I was like, I'm not spending my birthday in this, in this box. Um, I was done with the hospital. Um, and so then after that, it was basically like, wait and see and, and see if the, um, like the, the new immune system like takes to my body and if it works. And so then it, it started to, and it worked. And so then it was just like, you know, wait and watch and see. And they, you know, they, um, they talked about, uh, you know, that there's, you know, a small chance of, um, like the cancer coming back. And so, you know, something to think about and pay attention to. And then they also briefly talked about graft versus host disease and said, here are some, you know, here are some things to watch out for and just pay attention. Um, because this is really something that it, you don't really want. Um, it can be helpful in, in graft versus leukemia, um, but also like graft versus host is not ideal. So basically, and I, and I had to, it was the first hundred days, which is you have to stay in isolation. And so I moved in with my parents and basically like hit out there for three months and um, just sort of like, I, you know, there was a lot because of the transplant and, and you have a new immune system, you, I had to take like all of these pills, like antibiotics, antiviral, anti, you know, and so I would have IVs and I would have like different medications that I had to take and I was exhausted. And, and so it was just a lot of sort of building myself back up and kind of getting my energy back and kind of getting used to like my new immune system, basically. So when I, when they, yeah, when they explained GVHD to me, it, it was, it, you know, and this is, again, at this point, it's, it was still, yeah, it was 2001. And, and so it was, there were papers that were photocopies of photocopies of photocopies. And so it was kind of like the text was a little wavy and it was just kind of like dark in some areas and really light in others. But so there were three sheets of paper. One was for skin GVHD. One was for GI GVHD and one was for liver GVHD and those like for acute GVHD. And so they, they gave me those papers and, and I, I was very anxious about potentially getting GVHD because they, the way the, in the kind of in the research and, and discussing it, um, my family and I, we, you know, if you, you're more likely to die from acute GVHD um, than you are from, from chronic. And so I really didn't, I had just had this transplant. I was like, I'm, <laughs> I just need to keep going. Like I can't. So, um, so I like diligently read those, those papers every day. I checked my skin. I, you know, checked in with how I felt while I was eating, which was difficult anyway. Um, but then I, I developed a skin rash 
and it was, you know, and I, I'm a, I'm fair skinned, right. I'm, I'm like a, a pasty, pasty person. And so, you know, I, 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 my skin gets red. I get like rashes relatively easily, but this one was really different and it really, really hurt. It burned to the point where like clothing was difficult to wear. Um, it was hard to, sometimes like walking, um, just walking on the ground in shoes, socks, bare feet, whatever. It was just, it hurt so badly. And then, um, my stomach, like I started to get more nauseous. Uh, I got really sick, like with, in my belly, you know? And so then, um, I had a, uh, I still have, but I had a nurse coordinator. And so we called her and, and describe the symptoms. And she's like, okay, why don't you come in and, and we'll take a look. And then that's when I learned that I had, um, acute GVHD. Um, and that was in, uh, October, October of 2001. So it was really soon after my, my transplant. So I had acute GVHD and, um, and so I was being treated for that. I was given high doses of steroids and also some other immunosuppressive drugs to help um, really manage it. And um, and then there's this sort of it's and at this particular point in time, then you know it was very much um, like acute and chronic, and they're separate when in fact, actually, there's sort of an overlap. And, and so I think for myself, what happened is that my acute GVHD then sort of just transitioned into chronic. And so I was diagnosed with chronic GVHD in April of 2002. And, and so, and I, and the ways that it manifested, then it was, it continued to be uh, GI stuff. My skin was still problematic, but in a different way. Um, and I had, uh, oral, oral GVHD. And so, um, and then the thing with GVHD is that it's, you know, I mean, the, the way that it manifests is, is pretty unique to each person. Although there are, there are manifestations in main areas where they, where it tends to go but it kind of like randomly pops up sort of whenever. And so then the thing that happened for me is that over the last 22 years, um, every, I, I felt like I could clock it. Like every so many years, I would get some other version of it, some other manifestation. And so it, it turned into this sort of like roller coaster of, you know, I, I you know, my doctor would, you know, I'd have a manifestation, I'd have a flare up, I would get high doses of steroids, then he would try to taper me down, I'd get to a point, then something else would happen, he'd put me back on high doses, take me down again. And it just continued, it has continued like that um, for the last 22 years. And I've, I've always, except for like a month in January of 2020, I have not been off steroids. And I, I think I'm steroid dependent, I don't think that I'll ever be off of it. Um, which really is kind of a bummer, it kind of sucks, but it's not, you know, it's a great thing. It does great things. And also it's really, it does pretty bad things too. So with steroids and being on it very long term, you know, it's, it causes so many issues for, for people. And so I developed, um, I got what's called a vascular necrosis where you have bone death. So my bones would just die they just die and they don't regenerate usually bones die but then they regenerate so mine would just die they're still just dying but um but i take medication for it that's the other thing is that usually what would happen is that i would have i would have some kind of side effect or adverse effect or i would get a new diagnosis because of steroids and then have to take medication or some kind of treatment to manage the new diagnosis or the side effects from the treatment and so it turned into this very much like, okay, so you, you know, I had leukemia, I had the treatment for that. Now I have GVHD. Now I have the treatment for that, but I also have the treatment for that and the treatment for that. 
And so it turned into this like really, really r frustrating, ridiculous kind of thing, but also, you know, necessary because it wasn't until, um, cause my, my doctor and I have tried so many different things. I think I've been on pretty much nearly if like the most of the immunosuppressive drugs with the exception of some of the ones that are newer now and and so because i'm kind of in a place where i'm a little bit stable so like knock, knock on wood but like i'm kind of like okay you know if, if i don't need it i don't want it um and so but but we he and i had the conversation probably somewhere between five and 10 years ago, I think, where is he was just like, you know, Meredith, I don't, I think you may be on this for the rest of your life. So let's just see how, how low we can get the dose. Um, and so um, I, so he and I have, have worked on that and I'm on a really low dose. I'm on a really, um, it's pretty, excuse me, my nose is running. Like it's a, it's a pretty, like, it's a really manageable dose. And so, um, so, and it's an interesting thing because so some of the, like, for instance, I developed diabetes um, because of the steroids and bec but because of the dose. And so now that I'm on a lower dose of prednisone steroids, um, I don't have diabetes anymore. And so like, it's kind of a weird thing, right? Because usually once you have diabetes, you have it. And so it's, it's the whole process has just been really um it teaches uh patients and it teaches like how to be comfortable when things are uncomfortable and when it's unknown and not clear and there's that like anticipation of what's going to happen next you know because some of the like the one manifestation that i got in 2005 2006 was not really well known at the time. And, and so they had a really hard time diagnosing it. And so I got really sick. And so it just, and it was like, is this GVHD or is this something else? And so then it just turns into sort of like a, an like catch all autoimmune kind of experience. Um, I mean, I've been diagnosed with, uh, with other like autoimmune disorders at, which it could be GBHD. It could also be like fibromyalgia. It could also be like polymyositis. It could, you know, um, and so it's just a, it's, it's really confusing and tricky. So I've, I have coped and, and tried to manage like the mental and emotional impact of it. Um, one therapy, <laughs> hardcore therapy. Um, I think, one, I think everybody would benefit from it, but that's just my own bias. Um, but I, th I think that helped me a lot in, in kind of in learning how to um, tolerate the anxiety and the fear. And, and, the, and I think that too, the other thing is, is that um, it, it wasn't actually all that long ago, uh, a few years ago, I want to say, when I was actually um, diagnosed with uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. And I, my thought is probably because of like early days and how I was diagnosed, the whole 9-11 thing, like all, like I think, and then just over time, it's sort of like, you know, one thing after another. And so, um, and so I think it's important to, to recognize that that's something that's a possibility with chronic illnesses, with medical diseases like this. And, and so one of the things in therapy is really working through the, like that aspect of it and, and working through triggers and things of that nature. And then too, the other thing that happens a lot is depression. And, and so, you know, and I think that one of the things that I've had to do for myself is, is really do a lot of internal work around, um, acceptance and and sort of reframing what my priority is and 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 recognizing that just because 
I'm limited in some ways doesn't mean that I'm not able to do meaningful things. And, and, you know, I think that one of the, one of the big points, one of the really significant things that, that I, that I figured out maybe like 10 to 15 years in was that, um, I am not my disease and I am a person who has a number of illnesses, but that doesn't define me. And I define me. I decide how I live my days. I decide what I do with them. And, and they're, they're not dictated by illness. And I think that has been really important in terms of how I think about um, my life. Because there was a time when it just ruled everything in me. You know, I, I actually had somewhat of an identity issue because I was like, well, my this is my body, but it's not my body. It's my sister's. This isn't me. Who am I? You know, and, and just like in all of this, you know, not only is there that, but then there's, you know, there's before the cancer and who I was and what I thought my life would look like. And, you know, and everybody has that, that sort of like, oh, this is, and when I'm 30, this is what my life is going to be like, you know, and, and usually it doesn't turn out quite the same, but, but it, it was a really big difference. And, and it, and so, you know, I think just having to really just ground myself in, in, yeah, a lot of acceptance and a lot of like, I control what I can control and there are other things that I can't and that's okay. And, and, you know, I'll get to where I need to get however I get there. So for people who are, you know, in, in some place along this journey, you know, like whatever, wherever they may happen to be, um, I think the message, the thing that I want to help people understand and know, I think is, that, you know, kind of in continuation of that, like abundant thing is that within their, their own lives, if they just do one thing, then that can potentially turn into something else. And so, you know, if it's, if that one thing is, you know, making a phone call to a doctor because something doesn't feel right, then that's the one thing. And that, that moves you further along on your journey. If the one thing is just like, if you have no appetite and you're trying to eat, like eat a, eat a crack, part of a cracker. It's all, you know what I mean? Like just, you know, tiny things make such a difference. And, and so just to do that. And also the other thing that I think is really, really, really important is, is that, that concept around identity and around illness does not define you. And, and whether you're a caregiver or a patient or a doctor. I mean, the, the, the disease, the illness itself doesn't define who you are. And, and, and just to remember that because you can be a caregiver and also be so many other things. You can be a patient and so many other things. You can be a doctor and all of these other things. It doesn't have to dictate your life. One of the things that I that I say um, just to myself sometimes in, in general is just find your feet and just really like ground yourself. And, you know, just like if, if you're really overwhelmed, if you're reeling, if like you're there, you just got some news that's like, how am I going to, what am I going to do? How am I going to deal with this? Just find your feet, ground yourself in the moment that you're in and you can get from that moment to the next moment and you'll, you'll be okay. And I think just really kind of coming back to that, I think that's, that's something that has helped me a lot in, in this process.